All right, welcome into another episode of the Mountain West Insider Pod, and we finally got her. We finally got the commish. It took this long. I know you've been busy, Gloria, but um, you're, you're in a bunker right now in, in the bottom of Thomas and Mac. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. We got a little workroom back here where we do it. all the things away from the noise of the games. Well, listen, uh, congrats, first of all. Um, it, it's been one heck of a year. I mean, like, honestly, we couldn't have picked a better year to start this podcast uh, because you have given us no shortage of, of drama, of intrigue, of storylines, all of it. It's been awesome. I mean, you hear it around the country, don't you? Like, the Mountain West is the most fun league in America right now as far as for the men's basketball, uh, you know, the, from start to finish. It's been incredible. Um, have you kind of felt that way too? And and you're new to the league. So like coming in and having this as, as kind of an opening act is incredible. Well, don't forget my, you know, first couple months on the job, we went to the final four champ yes. game with San Diego yes. state. And, right. <clears throat> you know, of all the things we can control and actually have an impact on what's getting it done on the floor. We have no control over that, but we really, it makes everything easier when our teens and student athletes are killing it like they are this year. All right. So before we get into the Mountain West this year, I want to get into your background because I don't think a lot of people know your background. It's crazy to me. Like, you know, again, I grew up in Massachusetts, so we have a little bit of a, of a bond here. Um, yes. The state school is University of Massachusetts, which is out in the middle of nowhere in Amherst, Mass. All right. It's like it literally... Is. Uh, cows and and horses and and all of that. You are a West Coast uh, girl who ended up at University of Massachusetts playing basketball. How? Yes, why? sir. Why? <laughs> How? Why? What? If what happened? <laughs> you know, it's funny because you know you fill out those things in high school. Like, what do you want to be? My thing was marine biologist. <laughs> and you know, you don't leave California to go no. do that. <laughs> especially the Bay Area. Um, but yeah, you know, I got a basketball scholarship, which, you know, at the time it was, you know, kind of new-ish. I mean, certainly I, I credit Title IX to have that opportunity and um, signed my letter of intent late in June, took a campus visit. Boston and the East Coast is lovely in June. <laughs> Sold. Yes. yes, not so good. <laughs> hey, not so good when you got there in in. You know, September, you're good. And then by the time November hit, you're like, what, why did I do this? Well, I also learned what it's like to have your hair freeze when <laughs> it's not fully dry. I learned what Gore-Tex is. And yeah, and of course, my first year there, we had one of the worst winters ever in the East Coast. I'm like, mm -hmm, right. <laughs> no, but I had a blast and uh, majored in sport management and never looked back. So graduated, played, played there. Um, I, I don't want to age you. you. When were you around the Calipari era? When, how do you, how do you yes. relate to the Calipari era? My first year as a freshman at UMass was John Calipari's first year. So wow. watch that no program way. take off. Yeah. And oh you know, God. who played on that team, Derek Kellogg, Tony Barbie, um, there's a couple of other coaches, uh, Bruiser Flynn was on the bench at the time. So you saw it being built literally from the floor up and, and, have you stayed yes. in touch with Cat? Like, did you have any relationship with him through the years or just from afar? You know, he's so great that actually when I saw him, you know, 20 years later at a final four, I went up to introduce myself and he immediately remembered my teammates that really? year. I'm like, that's incredible. I can't remember last week. And here <laughs> you are remembering, you know, players from the women's team back in the day. So you graduate in sports management. They've actually got a great program. Mm -hmm. Great program. Yes. Um, yeah. And you get into administration and eventually take me through the, the quick clip notes version of how you became, you know, the commissioner of the, the WCC and, and obviously now only the second, which is crazy to say, only the second commissioner ever of the Mountain West because Craig Thompson was there for an eternity. Yeah. And we're also one of the younger leagues, 25 years. Yeah. But uh, to your point, graduated from UMass, came home, took a gap year, went to law school at Cal Berkeley. And knew I didn't want to practice law and kind of bopped down to the athletic department. At the time, they had one compliance person for 27 sports, 950 athletes. This is beginning days, right? You know, you're looking up interps, C colon backslash, like young people don't even know what that means. But I said, hey, do you need help? He said, yes. And because he was a lawyer, I did an externship. 
And um, this is a great way to use the law degree as well as stay around college athletics. I had a cup of coffee in a labor litigation firm and then took a 50% pay cut and went to be the first full-time compliance person at San Jose State. And from there, I went to back to Cal Berkeley to take place of my mentor at the time, Dan Coonan. From UC Berkeley, I went to WCC the first time as an associate commissioner. Then I went to Oklahoma, back to the Pac-12 for eight years, then commissioner of the WCC, and now commissioner of the Mountain West. All right, so you mentioned the Pac-12. Uh, I'm an Arizona guy, graduated from Arizona. And it, it, it's still, and you can speak to the landscape, the general landscape of all this, because obviously it's the biggest hot button topic right now if you're a commissioner. Yeah. Um, realignment, the change in conferences, the the football money, how it's kind of dominating uh, all of college sports right now. I, I hate it. I'm not going to lie to you. I hate the fact that I'm not going to have an Arizona-UCLA rivalry anymore or in Arizona, Arizona State. It wasn't much of a rivalry in college hoops, but whatever. It was still, you know, twice a year, you know, like, come on, you grew up. This is what I grew up around. You know, I'm a Massachusetts guy who went out to Arizona and, and really gained my love to a different level for college basketball. How hard is it for you to watch everything changing like this? Well, having worked in campuses in the league, worked in the league office for eight years, it's a 108-year-old league that honestly represents to me some of the best parts of college athletics. The fact, I mean, I went through the stages of grief. I'm still heartbroken. I, it, it's unfathomable to me. I just, I can't, I know in my mind it's happening. I still can't visualize what that's going to feel like next year. Yeah, Arizona and the Big 12. Like, really? Like, it just doesn't yeah. feel right. It's just not going to feel know. right. Um, with the, with regards to the Mountain West, how much are you losing sleep over over the fact of just kind of, again, the, the playing the what-if game, not knowing? Because, again, I think all you guys are, are friends with each other, commissioners, for the most part. You know, when you go into a room together – but it's almost like those one of those things where it's still business. At the end of the day, yeah. it's still business and making sure you're taking care of your members. Um, how how hard is it these days not knowing if you could trust anybody and people not knowing if they could trust you? Right. And so, you know, people have asked me, well, all this realignment, how has it been? And I said, you know, 99% of it is sourcing and running down rumors and hearsay and trying to sort out fact from fiction. Yeah. And I think right now, who knows, I could be wrong, but I think right now we're in a little bit of a lull. I think we've settled for a minute. Media deals have been signed. Membership agreements have been signed. So we may get a little bit of settling here. Uh, but certainly, you know, every commissioner, just like every president, every AD, your job is to look out for that entity. And that's what folks are doing. And, you know, unfortunately, that is, you know, the business side of it. Um you know, obviously, I love talking to you because you you do have a basketball background. Like that's the beauty of, of of talking to you here. You probably come at it a lot differently than a lot of commissioners do. So I'm gonna get into a little hoops here if we can. And Please do. You, you know, I I took a trip out, and believe it or not, in all my years of covering this sport, I had never been to Logan. I had never been to the Spectrum, and I had never been to the Pit. And I was almost ashamed to admit it. You know, like you, you kind of don't want to say it publicly, but eventually you have to say it publicly when you go for the first time. And uh, I went out there and saw what I thought at the time were the four best teams in the league. Now you can't even say that because there aren't four best teams in the league. Like they're all, they're all similar. That's the beauty of your league this year. Um, the environments, the spectrum, the students were unbelievable, like incredible. Um have you had a chance to get to every venue so far in in the yes. Mountain West? Have you? And, and that was a priority for me. I haven't seen a basketball game in all of them, um, certainly because I kind of started in, you know, late in the season last year. And then this year, we've been doing a lot of travel for CFP and some other things. But, you know, that's what I love about this league. We have a lot of, the, I think the glue, the tie that binds, the the, the similarity is, we have a lot of large public institutions that pride themselves on providing accessible education, being part of the community. You'll see, you'll feel a lot of, you know, first generation, uh, blue collar work ethic, um, that type of thing. 
And that really translates into really strong fan bases. Our fans show out. Yeah, I mean, do. our gyms yeah, were rocking. I mean, it was incredible. I was at the UNLV at Nevada game last night. And, you know, my Apple Watch is like, it's too loud. I'm like, how do I turn this off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Logan. I mean, the drive, first of all, just the drive from Salt Lake to Logan is something, right? I mean, beautiful. Like, you know, again, I'm a Boston guy. I don't see mountains very often, okay? I'm a, I went to Arizona, so I, I saw them then, but it's been a while. No, th those are hills. Those are hills? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and the job, like, it's the environments and it's the coaches, too. Like, I've known a lot of these guys for a long time, and – um you froze there you go okay i've known these guys for a long time and you know from dutch to richard patino uh to obviously you look at what danny John sprinkles Rice. yeah sprinkles yeah. done this year nico medved how about like, sprinkles story it's year amazing. one brand amazing. new squad right like coach you know again i don't know if he wins national coach of the year i generally give it to somebody that overachieves like generally i do that I'm torn this year because you got like Dan Hurley's done a great job. Kelvin Sampson's done a great job. You got Sprinkle, TJ Otso. Like there's a lot of candidates, but what Danny Sprinkle has done is absolutely ridiculous, right? And, you know, part of the reason you can, you can do it now is, and you couldn't years ago, is you bring those guys from Montana State. They have to sit out. People forget yeah. that, that they didn't have to sit out this year. So, you can bring some guys with you and be really good right away. Although I don't think a lot of people realize like these dudes from Montana state could play at this level and, and not just play at this level, start at this level. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's another hallmark I think of the mountain West when you're, you know, in this place in the ecosystem, high middle for a lot of things, yeah. even before transfer portal, even before name image likeness, we always, fed our talent our coaches our administrators you get some success at this level and you get really great opportunities but we always come back and rebuild like san diego state went to it the championship game and still lost a lot of guys on the roster and yet here we are again i mean it's part of this no one's going to outwork us. Young people, we find talent. And I wouldn't just say young people. I think coaches, administrators. I mean, we just, the amount of talent that is sitting around our tables right now and that have been in our league is astounding. All right. So we've said six bid uh, Mountain West all year, uh, Rob and I. And uh, can we say maybe seven? <laughs> can we? Could we? I, mean, I know we're getting greedy. Are we, are we getting too greedy? But if UNLV somehow wins the league tournament like legitimately i think new mexico's got to go a little bit deeper in the league tournament but like if things fall perfectly there's actually a chance that this league could get seven in which would be the most insane thing ever my question to you though is like all right how important you you get hopefully five six in and i don't know what you think you know is is real at this point we'll see obviously because you never know with a committee how important is it, though, that you guys show out when it matters most if you get six in that your teams produce when they get to the NCAA tournament? Yeah, and the entire any conference is built to get the most teams into the next level postseason play, in this case, NCAA men's basketball tournament, at the best possible position. And so in addition to getting in, it's also seeding because that really dictates – your chances of advancing. You know the tournament is no small part. Talent preparation, luck, yes. how you woke up that morning. I mean, it is a yeah. marathon, not a sprint. And things got to break your way. Certainly when you're seated better, they do. So um, superstitious, very much so am I. But so I'm not even going to comment on what you just said. But okay. yes, we're optimistic. <laughs> yeah, as, as well you should be. As well you should be. Hey, where do you stand on my idea? So expansion, number one, I've hated the idea of it for years. I've hated it just because I, I actually felt like 64 was the perfect number. Fine. They wore me down. 68 is what it is, the first four. I'm, I'm okay with it. I don't love it. My idea is 
for the final, like, well, you can do four spots, eight spots. Um, play a plan uh, and and have, now, again, I don't know where you guys fit in here, um, but but you know you don't fit in where where like Indiana State, uh, James Madison, like those two teams. If they don't make the the main bracket, you have them play two high majors that that again didn't make it, um, and the winners get in the main field. And I think you yeah. could play it before. Like I think that's the big to me. That's always the, the big dilemma the big argument, right. Is like, are you taking those one bid league teams over the, the teams that had a million chances? Now you guys are kind of in between cause you don't get a million chances in the non-conference. You know, some teams get them. San Diego state can get them. They've, they've earned that. They've built that up, but there's certain teams in your league. Let's face it. They can't get the high majors to come play them. Like they're just not. Um, so it's kind of different in your league a little bit. How do you how do you feel about expansion and how do you feel about my my I don't know if it's wild concept, but my concept? Well, you know, when I was on transformation committee, I actually served on the subcommittee that analyzed championships and the concept of expansion, not just about basketball, but certainly men's and women's basketball was one that the media picked up on. But the concept is, look, if you're going to crown a national champion you have to have a field that's large enough to make sure the best teams get in and can compete for it. While also I'm a big proponent of the AQs and I get how sometimes those who win the AQs aren't deserving or meritous. I'm doing air quotes, but it lends credence to a regular season play. It adds value to a conference champion and everyone needs something to fight for in the basketball scenario. I don't think you you rarely seen someone run from the first round to the championship game. So I feel the size of the field gets the best teams in. No one, I mean, certainly wherever you put the cut line, people are going to be upset if they're just outside it. But so far, the teams that win get to the final weekend are the ones that were in the field. Yep. And, you know, I'm a little bit of a, if it ain't broke, <laughs> I'm with you. No, I, I, I think that's that's my problem is some of the, the big boy commissioners, they just want as many teams from their league in. I get it because they're expanding, but but don't screw up. The one thing that the NCAA does best, let's face it, is what? The NCAA tournament. It that really is. is. It's the best yeah. thing they do. So don't screw it up. I mean, again, I don't love my idea. Like, if, if it were up to me, I would actually go back to 64. But but I think if you're going to expand, expand I, that I'm way. That because cool. If you're going to. Yeah. Okay, add a little at the edges, but don't yes. fundamentally change the structure. And I'm a huge proponent of the 31, now 31 AQs going forward. Yeah, if they eliminate the AQs, you're going to eliminate what what the common fan loves about March Madness and the tournament, which is yeah. the little guy beating the big guy, period. Like yeah. that's what that's what everybody loves, right, is, is David beating Goliath. And if you eliminate all those, you are just, I don't know, you're cutting down on the more, the opportunities. And it's so fun. It's one of the properties that even non-sports fans start tuning into. I have friends who don't watch sports at all, but they do a March Madness bracket, whether they do it on mascots, uniform color, whatever, they're having a blast. Um, all right. So give me the, the, the highest maintenance men's basketball coach and, and you can, you can admit it. <laughs> You can admit it's Richard Pitino. You can fully admit. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, you you do have some like unbelievable personalities, don't you, in the league? Yeah. Well, they're brilliant coaching minds. Yes. Yes. They um, definitely are pushing excellence. I always say, especially when I was on campus as an administrator, m many of our best coaches are just shy of the crazy line and as administrators it's our job to keep them right on that edge because they're brilliant and they're pushing hard and they're inspiring but you know you, you gotta you gotta stay on the side of sanity so yeah no we have such a it, our coaches rooms across the league are amazing they gotta be they gotta be uh nil a couple more quick things here um how much is this talked about within league circles uh with coaches with administrators with you, you know, obviously I know New Mexico has got really good NIL in the league. Um, 
you know, and then there's, there's probably some tears, right? I know Utah State doesn't have much, which honestly makes what Sprinkle's done even that much more amazing. But how do you as a commissioner, how do you try to get – because I, I bet you're probably – I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong because you're you a player. Um, but I bet you're, you're torn a little bit with some of this NIL stuff um, in a sense that you want players – to certainly be compensated and rewarded for what they do. But, but some of this is hard to take too, Gloria. Some of this is hard to take well, where, you know. And it's the nature of the organization and our governance structure. We just never moved with the times. We never blinked when social media came on board and people started being influencers. And so then we got pushed all the way into, and I, I do believe student athletes should be able to monetize their name, image, likeness. But we went all the way from zero to... Quick. Yes. And that's been awful. I would love to see us put pay for play back. I, I would just, I like to see that our student, our campuses could be involved. And so your original question, like, what are we doing as a league? There's still a prohibition of too much involvement. There's still a prohibition or a limitation that we're only in the education and information practices. Um, And that's, hurtful because a lot of this stuff is happening with third parties. And if the schools, you know, you, you read about student athletes signing the rights away into perpetuity or signing deals that aren't coming to fruition and they have yes. no recourse or vice versa. They sign a deal and didn't realize what they were signing and then they aren't meeting the terms. And we just, we just need more in that space. And I'm um, an advocate for and a proponent of Charlie Baker's platform for reform in that area, but it's going to take help from Congress. Yeah, I like Charlie a lot, obviously, uh, being here in Massachusetts. Um, I actually saw him at a UMass football game. Did you really? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I just think he walked into a situation that, honestly, you know, he was digging out of a hole that was just too big and he's too far behind at this point. But I think he's got some great ideas and, and I think he's uh, very smart and well-liked and um, it, it just it may be a little bit uh, too little too late. All right, last one I have for you. The, the conference tournament coming up. Give me kind of your your top storylines going in. Obviously, the number one is like how many teams coming out of here can you can you get into the NCAA tournament? But what are you looking at from from a commissioner standpoint, from a basketball player standpoint? What what are you yeah. looking at? Uh, I, I I wish I was there. I mean, again, I, I think I told you this. For me, it was a choice. I wanted to go to the two venues over the tournament. Um, I haven't seen a lot of big 12 teams, so I'm going to, I'm going to go by there. I may pop over for a day. I'm not sure yet. Um, but man, the, going to those two venues was so worth it for me. Cause they were probably, I, I said it, I've been, you know, I was at Duke earlier this year. I was at Kansas. That was my favorite trip of the year. And, and part of it is, yeah. you know what part of it is? And then you can get to your, your answer, which I've gone off completely off topic here, but, um, the appreciation to. I think is part of it with, with your kids, like just talking to like great Osibor, you know, and Darius Brown and talking to them a little bit about like, Hey, what's it like here? You know, coming from Bozeman, Montana to here, totally different, like night and day in terms of, you know, uh, school and, and campus and atmosphere and all that. And it's just like good kids and your coaches are a little bit more humble and, and grounded. I, it just, I feel pure. I feel honestly, I feel better about college basketball. I do. It is. It is the hallmark of we did this whole strategic plan and branding product. But what you're articulating, that kind of the work ethic, the nothing take it for granted, the appreciation for having the opportunity is something so central. And then, you know, to your question about our tournament, our last three to four weeks of conference play have been amazing yes. displays of athleticism yes. all out rock fights yes. i mean i don't know how many sports center top 10 moments from last minute shots to yes. miraculous comebacks but the amazing basketball on the floor from a you know from a commissioner standpoint we don't coach athletes we don't hire coaches we don't build facilities but when this type of thing happens our job is to amplify what's going on and what the student athletes and the coaches are achieving this year has just made things a lot easier and super fun. It's incredible, especially if you have any kind of love for the sport. What we have going on in this league right now is a very, very special moment in time. So what are you doing this week? Like, what do you, what do you do 
be, before you go, are you a fan in a way? And you're sitting there and watching all these games. Are you, how much work are you, how much work it, it compared to play is this for you uh, during the, the men's and women's? No, I, yeah. <laughs> we have a very capable crew running our event. Um, I am not so much a fan. I have to be completely neutral, but yes. certainly just watching all this great basketball is incredible. And honestly, we're just hoping for really good games. Yeah. And make the best team win. And you know, that's not always the one with the highest net ranking on that night. But our goal is to have an event that prepares these teams and gives them an opportunity to make a case for the NCAA selection. And we're certainly set up to have a lot of fun to do that this year. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's been a, a fun ride this year. I mean, like, again, year one of doing this podcast and getting this year from the league is like the ultimate home run. I, I think we have to maybe we'll do it again next year and, and hope to just duplicate the, uh, the results. Uh, yeah. But, well, no. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on the journey with us, but yeah. it just really, the fact that you felt and picked up on that genuine humility, the good humanness part of the people that are on the court and the, you know, not taking it for granted. These are, you know, these years during their experience oh. in college and being able to play sports in these venues in front of these crowds, it's a it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it just, it warms my heart to know that the good young people on the floor really appreciate and understand that. No, it's awesome. All right, well, we'll do it again soon. Hopefully I'll see you along the way uh, somewhere at an NCAA tournament venue, uh, definitely in Phoenix. Um, and uh, we'll, yep. we'll definitely connect there, but appreciate the time and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Jeff. Appreciate you. You got it.